Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our luncheon today. Uh, those of you who are new to the Institute hopefully received a packet on our work. And um, as you know, the Institute regularly holds uh, lectures and debates and other seminars here in Oakland and also in our, in our conference center in Washington. Uh, today is no exception, and we're very pleased to host uh, a longtime friend of the Institute and research fellow, Dr. Fred Singer. Um, as you know, he's going to be speaking on hot, the hot talk and cold science of global warming, especially in the aftermath of, of Climate Gate and after Kyoto and uh, what's called the hockey stick. Uh, Dr. Singer is also the author of our book um, of a similar name, Hot Talk Cold Science, which I recommend for anyone who hasn't gotten it. Um, Hot Talk Cold Science had a very big impact, and uh, uh, we're very pleased to have had the privilege of working with Dr. Singer over the years. The Institute itself, as you may know, is a public policy research institute. We have about 140 fellows, and we produce lots of books. Uh, this is our journal, The Independent Review, uh, and you're welcome to get a copy out outside as well as others of our publications. Um, in, the pa in the packet you got, um, I also wanted to point out that there is a save the date card for a gala that we're going to be holding on November 15th in San Francisco. And this will be to commemorate our 25th anniversary, which uh, we are now in the process of celebrating. We're going to be honoring three uh, distinguished figures one is Lech Walesa from Poland, who is the uh, gentleman who spearheaded the solidarity movement that ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, he's also a Nobel Peace Prize winner and former president of Poland. <clears throat> the second honoree is Mario Vargas Llosa, a Peruvian who won the Nobel Prize in Literature this past December. And the third is our senior fellow, Robert Higgs, who edits our journal and is the author of many of our books. Uh, Dr. Higgs is a, is a renowned economist and historian, and his work is particularly timely today because of the Washington spending and debt uh, mongering in the context of this economic uh, malaise and his insights on the precedent set by doing this during the 1930s and 40s, and how that is also producing a similar impact today and what should be done about it. <clears throat> Our topic is, of course, um, the issue of climate change and global warming. It's certainly a contentious one. Um, the question, one of the questions is, is global warming real? Is it imminent? Is it a threat to human life? Is it a threat to the ecosystem? What is the evidence that global temperatures are rising and why or not? Uh, what has been actually shown scientifically uh, and what has not? Uh, what is the truth about some of the revelations like Climate Gate and others um, as far as the nature of the evidence and also uh, the nature of the, of the debate and uh, whether there's a certain amount of corruption um, afoot. Uh, in California, of course, California has mandated that there will be uh, an extensive series of controls on uh, the use of fossil fuels, essentially CO2 emissions. The EPA is pursuing um, things m of a similar nature, even though Congress voted against it. Uh, so that's part of the context. And um, uh, generally speaking, it's, it's um, it's going to touch everything we do. I mean, it's not just an environmental issue per se. It's really a proposal to micromanage human life. So um, our guest today is the renowned astrophysicist Fred Singer. Uh, in addition to being a fellow with the Institute, he's president of the Science and Environmental Policy Project. He's also professor emeritus of environmental science at the University of Virginia, distinguished research professor. 
at the Institute for Space Science and Technology. He's also a distinguished research professor at George Mason University. He received his PhD in physics from Princeton University. He's a recipient of, it seemed like a, almost an endless uh, list of, of awards, the White House Special Commendation, the Gold Medal Award from the Department of Commerce, First Science Award from the British Interplanetary Society. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which that alone is a story. Um, and the list just goes on. He um, was chief scientist for the U.S. Department of Transportation, vice chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Oceans and Atmospheres, and so on and so forth. So I don't want to uh, take all of our time up with his <laughs> wonderful <laughs> credentials, which alone I think is, is uh, worth noting. So I'll just turn it over to Fred and uh, uh, have him begin. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, David. Uh, you're cutting into my time, you know. <laughs> I'm uh, very grateful to you for inviting me here. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, I wanted to share with you some of, my, some of the things that I've learned in the last few years about climate issues. And I want to discuss three main questions. You might ask, why three questions? And why not a dozen? David just presented at least 10. Well, I have to tell you a personal story about myself. So bear with me. When I was eight years old, I was told that I had to study Latin. I hated it. I asked him, why do I have to study Latin, dead language? And they said, well, it'll teach you how to think. Um, you know, when you're eight years old, you don't, you don't question your elders. So I studied Latin, and I remember my first sentence was, Sicilia insula est. Sicily is an island. <laughs> you know, it's a tremendous truth you discover suddenly the, <laughs> the fact that may have been known to people, but you know, to me it was not known, and um, I learned that. I've been in Sicily in August, and I look forward to meeting the inhabitants of that island, and I will tell them, Sicilia Insula Est, and I'm sure they'll be astounded at the famous uh, field marshal and later emperor who was assassinated, wrote a book called De Bello Gallico, about the wars in Gaul all of which he won. He conquered all of what is now France. And uh, since at the time, I remember I did something awful. I must have misbehaved. I was forced to memorize the first page of the book. That was my punishment. And I still remember the first sentence, which is, Gallia est omnis divisa in partis tres. Gaul is divided into three parts. This has lesson has stuck with me all my life. And ever since then, I've divided all my talks and all my writings <laughs> into three. <laughs> so that's what I will do today. The first question I will address has to do with what is the cause of climate change? Is it natural or is it man-made? That turns out to be the most important of all of the questions because it's not just science, but it also impacts on policy. All of the regulations that are coming forth from Washington and from Sacramento and from CARB here in California are based on the idea that the cause of climate change is human, not natural, and therefore we must do something about it. Well. Yes or no? You know, uh, the cause of climate change is very difficult to establish. If you look at a thermometer and you see the temperature going up year after year, all you can tell is that it's warming. It doesn't tell you what the cause is. Now you can ask the thermometer, but unfortunately they don't talk. And even if they did talk, you can't be sure they're telling the truth. You know, thermometers are very funny. So, we have to rely on some other method of establishing the cause. What might this method be? 
glaciers are no good because all they do is they tell you it's getting warmer when they, and heat melts ice. Well, we know that. When it gets cold, ice will grow. So it turns out that the climate has been changing, warming and cooling and warming and cooling. And I've written a book about this. Um, it's actually unstoppable. We can't affect these natural fluctuations. So the book is called Unstoppable Global Warming. Uh, it is unreasonable to think that these natural fluctuations of climate would suddenly stop in the 20th century. So they must still be going on. So natural causes are certainly plausible. What about human causes? They are plausible too. One has to be honest about these matters. Human activities, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, has led to the burning of fuels to create energy, electricity. We burn coal, we burn oil, we burn gas. Every one of these chemical reactions produces carbon dioxide. And as a matter of fact, we know that carbon dioxide has been increasing in the atmosphere as a result of human activities. Very few people will question that. I don't question that. That's real. That's measured. These are data. And carbon dioxide, as we all know, is a greenhouse gas, which means it will absorb some of the heat rising from the Earth and not let it escape into space. So the increase in carbon dioxide could certainly be the cause of global warming. That's also plausible. So how do you decide which of these possible alternatives is the more important one? Notice I say the more important one. It's, a, it's not a black and white situation. Both of these causes are acting, and it's a matter of deciding which is important. Because that's the only way you can predict what's going to happen in the future. Well, I will discuss in more detail later, the only way to establish the cause is to compare observations, detailed observations, with the predictions of greenhouse models, climate models, which have been constructed in the last uh, decade or two, and see whether they agree. If they agree, it doesn't really prove anything. If they disagree, then you have something. If they disagree, it either shows that the models are wrong, or that the observations are wrong, or they're, or they're both wrong. They disagree. And we've established that the models are wrong. That's been the main impact of our work, to show that the observations are correct, and the models are not. This has very important policy consequences. It means that the climate changes that we see, whether it's warming or cooling, are natural. There's very little we can do about them. And that all of us uh, hue and cry and sturm und drang and all the anxiety, all the alarmism that's coming forth is hokum, bunk, doesn't do anything. None of the remedies suggested will work, will affect, the, have the slightest effect on climate. Restrictions on carbon dioxide emissions make absolutely no sense because carbon dioxide, in fact, is a natural constituent of the atmosphere and is very beneficial for agriculture. That's what plants live on. I'd be glad to talk more about this if there are questions on this. So that first question we, we consider settled. Unfortunately, a lot of people like Al Gore do not agree with us. So we have a problem, and our problem is to explain the situation as clearly as we can to a lot of people, 
particularly to the press, to the media, and try to convince them to give us a fair shake and to present this point of view to the general public. Let me turn to the second question. The second question is purely scientific. It has no public policy value. And the question is, OK, if there's a disagreement between the models and observations, why is that? Why don't the models accurately describe what's happening in the atmosphere? That's an important scientific question. And it's being debated right now. There are different points of view on this. Um, within this skeptical community, of which I'm a member, there are different points of view. And we debate these issues frequently, not violently, but frequently. And we haven't yet reached an agreement. One group says it's a negative feedback. Those of you who are in electrical engineering will understand what I mean. Another group, including myself, think it's saturation. That is, if once carbon dioxide reaches a certain level, adding any more won't do much. It saturates. We'll have to see. Then there's a third question, which is also scientific. And that's really an interesting question, which is, so what is actually causing climate change? What are these natural causes that I've been mentioning without giving you any details? And again, the two schools of thought. One says it's internal, and the other says it's external. Now, what does that mean? The internal school says that climate change is naturally because of internal effects, there's oscillations between the atmosphere and ocean. They say the ocean atmosphere system is like a pendulum. It swings back and forth. That's a very plausible idea, and many people, many scientists believe this, and there's some data that supports it. On the other hand, the external boys and girls uh, believe that the sun is responsible for climate fluctuations. And specifically, it is a solar emission of particle streams and magnetic fields, the kind that cause the uh, northern lights, the aurora borealis, uh, the streams that affect the intensity of cosmic rays hitting the Earth's atmosphere. Actually, I belong to this latter school uh, mainly because of my past work in solar terrestrial relation. But we haven't yet quite figured out just how the sun can affect the climate, you know, the exact mechanism. It has something to do with clouds, but the details are still a little obscure. So I won't discuss it here, since it's obscure and since we don't quite fully understand it myself. Instead, I'd like to go back to the, the first question, the more important one, the most important one, the one that has policy significance, and try to bring home the fact that we can now say with some confidence, with some confidence, that the primary cause of climate change is natural and not man-made, that all of the regulations and attempts to control the climate, particularly through the control of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, all these attempts are useless, even counterproductive, and certainly very, very expensive. Very expensive. You know, President Obama promised in his campaign that the price of electricity would skyrocket. And I think he's fulfilling his promises. Price of electricity and all sorts of energy has gone up, mainly because it has become very expensive for power companies to generate electricity, and they simply pass the cost along to the ratepayer. And if you look at your, the price of gasoline for your car, you'll see that's gone up. 
and it has a lot to do with the fact that the government now mandates the addition of ethanol to your gas tank in an effort to uh, use what are called biofuels instead of fossil fuels. There's no guarantee that this will do anything to reduce the use of fossil fuels. All it will do is make gasoline more expensive. And the whole ethanol business, as you will probably find out within the coming year, is going to collapse, sell short. It's going to collapse as soon as government subsidies stop. All of this is being held up by government subsidies for which we're paying both as taxpayers and as the users of energy. So to summarize, this is an important subject. It affects all of us. It's important to our economy. I think the United States will survive this particular episode of madness. I'm not so sure about Europe. They've gone crazy on this idea and it probably will ruin the economies of some of the major European countries. We'll have a chance to watch this in action and I hope we will learn an important lesson. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions, but I'll let the chairman lead off. Before we open up to uh, questions from the audience, uh, there are a couple things um, I'd like to ask Fred more directly. Um, the first one is, uh, Fred, you mentioned that there's this discrepancy between the climate models, which is the theoretical um, formulation of the view that CO2 and man-made CO2 in particular is driving climate change is uh, not in sync with the actual data. Can you be more specific about where the data is coming from and what the discrepancy is? Yeah. What we have done, and it will appear in the next edition of this book, which I hope will be forthcoming. He keeps pushing me on this. Uh, within a few months, because I've been saying this for some time, but now I'm really serious. So the third edition will show that the pattern of warming that's been observed does not agree with the pattern that is predicted by climate models. Uh, it, the method is called, sometimes referred to as the fingerprint method. Greenhouse warming has a particular fingerprint. It produces, it should produce a pattern of warming that matches the, that which is predicted from the greenhouse models. When we look at the actual observations, which come from weather balloons that carry radio sounds, and also from weather satellites, these are independent measurements, both of these sets of measurements show patterns that do not agree with the model pattern. So we can be really, really sure that there is a disagreement. <coughs> there are some people who object to this and we're fighting them right now. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, scientific uh, fights can be a lot of fun if you're on the winning side. <laughs> we think we are. Now earlier <coughs> in Hot Talk Cold Science, for example, uh, you have in there about the uh, short of having the, the fingerprint evidence, you had the indication of the actual readings comparing satellite and balloon uh, data with surface station data. Yes. On page 15, as a matter of fact, figure 9 shows the dis disparity between satellite data and, and ground-based data. And the disparity is in the wrong direction. The models all predict that the disparity should be opposite. So the observations are opposite to what is actually calculated. And since, as scientists, we should always go with observations, because those are the real facts, we suspect 
that the models are not just wrong, but they're incomplete, shall we say. Why I'll, be, I'll be kind. Why, why is it that the, the surface station data is not in sync with the balloons and satellite? The surface station data is contaminated in various ways. Uh, I can describe different ways. It gets a little detailed. But the most important one that I'm sure you're all familiar with is something which we call the urban heat island effect. It's described also in this book. In fact, we show data taken from California that show that the warming is really fictitious and occurs mainly because of the effects of urban warming. You know, urban centers are much warmer than the countryside because that's where energy is generated. Since then, we've learned a lot of new facts which confirm all of this. So we haven't changed our position, but we would got additional confirmation. Let me mention some of these items of confirmation. Some of them come from emails that were leaked from a server, a computer server, uh, used by the members of the UN IPCC group. Uh, the, the whole event is called Climate Gate. Have you heard of that? Yeah. And we've learned that uh, they have treated the data in a certain way. They, use, they analyze surface stations, weather station data. Well, there are two problems. It depends on how you select the data and how you treat them. So we asked them, or they've been, uh, I didn't ask them, but they were asked to produce the original data. They said, we don't have them anymore. All we have are the improved data. Oh, well. Now there's an effort underway at Berkeley to reestablish, as it were, the original situation. And we're anxious to see what they come up with. I'm not uh, making any predictions here. I wait to see what they come up with. I want to read the report and comment on it. Uh, we do have here, for example, an interesting graph. I'll give you the page number, if I can find it. Uh, first of all, on page 13, Figure 7 shows the results from California weather stations. <coughs> the top graph shows a rapid increase in temperature. Those are weather stations that are located in urban centers, in urban regions, in counties that have more than a million people. The middle graph shows a moderate increase in temperature, and that comes from weather stations that are located in moderately populous counties. And the bottom graph shows no general increase, and that comes from weather stations located in counties that have less than 100,000 people. So it clearly shows the urban effect. And now, of the 107 weather stations in California, you have to understand California is a very rich, or was a very rich state. Uh, they can afford to have lots of weather stations. Most states don't have that many. So they had 107 stations. And now, let me ask you, how do you suppose one arrives at a single value for global warming, or for warming, for California. This shows on page 47 the trends of the 107 stations. And it also shows, just by chance, it's from a published paper, the way in which certain of the stations were selected. And you'll notice that all the stations that were selected were those that were warming, and none of them were cooling. So selection has a lot to do with it. Now, I'm not accusing these people of being dishonest. But how do they select stations? And why do they select stations that are warming? Well, 
they were using their best judgment in trying to select stations which they thought were good. <laughs> Quick question for you. Where do you suppose are the best stations located? Where were there people to read them? In, in airports. Yeah. In airports, because that's where you need good weather information. And airports are warming. And I will admit that airports are warming. That's not global warming. Airports are warming. So the only weather stations we have, for example, in Africa are in airports. So if you take those stations, you must get a warming trend. Doesn't mean that there's global warming. It's artificial because the airports are warming, because air traffic is increasing. In my airport, for example, at Dulles, outside of Washington, it used to be out in the boondocks. It's now become a thriving city. They've built new runways. The traffic has increased by leaps and bounds, and it is warming. But it doesn't represent Virginia. It just represents one little spot in Virginia. Uh, two other questions uh, before we open it up. Second question is uh, one of the issues in the climate gate emails that came out was uh, pertaining to this hockey stick. Uh, the hockey stick being uh, this uh, claim, claimed res result by a uh, former colleague of yours at the University of Virginia, Michael Mann, uh, who uh, claimed that the pattern of temperatures was essentially even for a long, long time, and then uh, in the latter part of the 20th century started to spike up because of industrialization. And uh, there's two parts of, the, of this question. One is that, uh, do you have any comments specifically about that? And second, um, since uh, in the emails it talks about, um, quote unquote, hiding the decline, um, the general consensus that I've seen, including from people at uh, the University of East Anglia in some of the uh, press accounts is that the temperature record that is disturbing is that it doesn't seem to be going up since at least 1998, perhaps even before, and either it is level or what I've seen is that it's a very tiny decline, hence the decline. I'll comment on that. It's not in this book because the matter only came up in 1999, and this was written in 19, two years earlier. Uh, it will be in the next book. You can be sure of that. Now let me just explain again what the hockey stick is. It uh, pretends to be the global temperature record of the last thousand years. And as David has pointed out, it shows essentially no warming or cooling, for 900 years, and then suddenly in the 20th century, a huge warming. And that's why it's called the hockey stick. You see, it's the shaft is 900 years long, and then the blade is this sudden rise in temperature. It's a hockey stick on its side. Um, it was produced by a scientist by the name of Michael Mann. And I'm sorry to say he was at the University of Virginia. Uh, but after my time. So I'm not responsible for getting him there, and he's no longer there. Uh, look, uh, I don't accuse him of being uh, a fraud, at least at this stage. We have to be careful. Uh, I think he made honest mistakes. We, these mistakes have been found. Uh, there are mistakes in the methodology, the statistical methodology, quite intricate quite specialized. They were found, these mistakes were found by two Canadian statisticians, Steve McIntyre and Ross McKittrick, and they published their work and showed that what man had produced was bunk. And they proved it by sticking in random data, completely random data, and they got the hockey stick back. So no matter what data you put into his algorithm, you always get a hockey stick. You always get this 20th century warming. 
Uh, not only that, but the result disagrees with all of our historic information about the global climate of the last thousand years. We know from historic records and from actual measurements of uh, geological type measurements that it was much warmer a thousand years ago than it is today. We know, for example, that Greenland was actually green, at least the southern tip, and that uh, Norsemen were able to live, settle in Greenland, practice agriculture, raise cattle, and lead a normal existence in Greenland during this period of medieval warming from about 900 to 1200 AD. And then the climate became very cold and we entered what's called the Little Ice Age. And we know that also from historic records. That was a very bad time. Uh, the climate was so cold that crops failed in Europe, particularly in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, in Germany, in Holland. Uh, in England, the Thames River would freeze over in, during the winter. You could have ice fairs on the Thames. New York Harbor froze over. You could walk from Staten Island to Manhattan. The British actually care, uh, pushed cannons from Staten Island to Manhattan during the Revolutionary War. So this little ice age did exist. It's not shown in Michael Mann's analysis. So we know it's completely wrong. Most people have focused on that, but the IPCC, that is the UN science group, has adopted the hockey stick as their icon. And I think they regret it now. Uh, because they interpreted it to mean that the 20th century is unusually warm. And that to them suggested that it must, it must be human caused. Of course it isn't, as I've explained earlier. That's not what the models and uh, fingerprints disagree with the observed fingerprints. Anyway, I have focused on the fact that Michael Mann stopped his analysis of data, the hockey stick, suddenly stops in 1979. You know what? I wrote him, said, what about the data after 1979? He wrote back, email, they'll be sorry that because I kept the email, uh, I'll publish that. He wrote back saying, there aren't any such data. That's baloney. I had several such data, not enough to really publish on it, but it's quite clear now that we do have such data and they don't show any warming. So the reason he didn't, he stopped his hockey stick in 79 is because his data suggested no warming. That's hiding the, that's the hiding the decline. So he was trying to be politically correct because if there's no warming, then there can be any, can't be any effect of carbon dioxide means no regulation, means that Al Gore is wrong, and he preferred not to talk about that. Anyway, we're going to have a lot of fun with this. <laughs>